All right, let's talk about what's going on with SWOG. I'm having flashbacks right now to Eric Vallier being up here, so this is kind of a deja vu. Okay, so let's start off with the uh, trials that are currently open. So, um, and so put this trial together for SWOG. It was recently opened, uh, it's S1619. It's a feasibility uh, phase one, two trial on the safety of using uh, neoadjuvants as platinum primatrexid along with atezolizumab uh, in resectable uh, mesothelioma. So the primary endpoints are basically to evaluate the safety of adding on an uh, IO to a currently accepted regimen of chemotherapy. Patients will get it as a window of uh, opportunity. Secondary endpoints looking at uh, PFS, overall survival and odd ratio of, uh, of neoadjuvant therapy, completion, et cetera, toxicity, et cetera. Exploratory endpoints looking at tumor and blood correlates. There's no preempt. Uh, requirement that patients are pd one positive before going on to the study. The background is that patients with NPM, it's a highly mutated tumor, uh, very immunogenic, and some studies have been done showing that uh, pd one positivity in patients with NPM uh, shows worse overall survival. Uh, moreover, that upwards of about 40 percent of the patients that were looked at in one series had pd one high expression. So the proposal was is that by adding a PDL1 inhibitor, that it would uh, uh, remove the stops on the immune system to attack the tumor and improve the uh, overall response to chemotherapy up front before surgery. Inclusion: patients have to be resectable, um, either to undergo pleurectomy, decortication, or EPP, um, epithelioid, or biphasic. So uh, the sarcomatoids are being excluded, and any prior history of autoimmune disease, uh, cardiac or pulmonary comorbidities. Here's the trial schema. So this is a single arm trial. Patients that are resectable, MPM, uh, 24 patients are going to be included in the trial. Uh, it's a small trial on feasibility. They're going to get standard of care, cispramatrexid and atezolibumab for um, four cycles. And then if there's no progression, uh, the patients that will then be evaluated for uh, pleurectomy de decortication or EPP. Um, and it depends on a, a game time decision, obviously. And then they were, they're going to be um, optional for radiation therapy and then go on to maintenance. Success of the therapy will be um, defined as patients who are able to undergo complete therapy, including the, ke the chemo with IO up front as a window of opportunity, followed by surgery, and then at least one s cycle of maintenance therapy at the end. Um, they're only calling for 24 evaluable patients. So in terms of who's going to open this trial, um, there are already seven sites that have said that they would enter into the trial. Having said that, uh, those sites are probably not high enough volume to be adding many patients to a 24-patient trial. So we're looking for sites to enter into this study. Obviously, we want sites that are capable of doing EPPs or PDs, um, and higher the volume, uh, the better. So w will this be open through the intergroup mechanism then? Like, can other groups get in on this or not? As of now, it's only open through SWOG. Okay. So I suspect that Anna's going to try to push it through, but because the number is only 24 valuable patients, it's difficult and time-consuming to get through the intergroup uh, process. So CTIP did, did approve it. The other thing is that the funding for it is only limited to the drug. So uh, getting funding to go through an intergroup uh, mechanism is not easy. Mm -hmm. So it's a standard of care trial with the addition of IO, and the IO is being paid for by the company. Everything else is coming out of standard of care. Okay. Uh, trials that are in development. So a long trial in development. This is a pretty exciting trial. Tina Cascone over at MD Anderson is working on this trial. This is a platform uh, trial for induction immunotherapy uh, for early stage resectable patients. This is exciting for us as surgeons because uh, we've been talking a lot about neoadjuvant therapy and window of opportunity trials, but there hasn't been a lot that's been within our purview to go after lately, and we've gone from doing a lot of these trials with alphabet soup in the past 10 years to, you know, doing uh, operations as usual. So basically, we find that the response rate for platinum-based therapy is at least 40 percent, but there's no significant increase with perioperative mortality. So this is the, the rationale for why neoadjuvant chemotherapy has been utilized. There's an absolute five-year overall survival improvement of 5 percent in recent meta-analysis. And to be frank, I mean, we're using a lot more neoadjuvant chemo in the setting of patients who have high lymph node disease and, and marginally resectable disease at Anderson, and it's been working out well. So the potential advantages of a window of opportunity trial, I like to call them the WU trials, is that you can get a higher dose intensity of the chemo up front rather than adjuvant. So new adjuvant therapy is tolerated a lot better than adjuvant therapy. 
you get prognostic information because once you've delivered the therapy and resected the tumor, the amount of pathologic response serves as a uh, pathologic indicator for the potential overall survival as a surrogate endpoint, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next couple slides. There is opportunity for biomarker discovery because you have um, tissue before uh, chemotherapy and then after resection, and the potential to deliver standard adjuvant therapy after surgery is, is available as well. So a major pathologic response is a surrogate to survival following knee adjuvant therapy. This has been championed by the breast group and has actually been considered by the FDA to be a potential surrogate endpoint to overall survival. The significance of this is that patients who have undergone therapy, in order to determine whether that, that therapy is improving overall survival, it could take us 10, 12 years to, to get a trial finished. But in a situation where you're looking at miss immediately at the histoviability of the tumor or seeing a major pathologic response, as a surrogate endpoint to overall survival, you can determine the potential feasibility of adding another therapy on immediately after resection, which means that we could complete trials within a year or two and move on to larger trials. So here's some work that was done uh, out of our group. It's also been validated by other groups with lung cancer showing that overall survival, if you have the residual tumor less than or equal to 10% is much better than if you have greater than 10% residual tumor after resection, looking at histoviability. So here's what the platform will look like. Um, patients with resectable non-small, anywhere from stage 1B, a little bit larger, greater than four centimeters to 3A, non-bulky and our deemed surgical candidates then would then go through six to nine weeks of, of standard therapy plus immunotherapy. These uh, different drug combinations have not been decided. Every time we've put uh, something in here, Pembro, chemo, et cetera, it turns out that this field is moving so quickly it's tough to get in front of it. So we'll propose something, and as we're getting the trial in development, someone is already publishing on it or already doing it, uh, and so it becomes obsolete. So the nice thing about this platform is that we're able to do small studies where in each individual combination, you'll test between 20 and 40 patients, look for a major pathologic response, and if you get a great response, uh, you can move that into phase two or three trials and then move on to another combination and test that. So it's a sequential platform for testing new, new um, potential uh, drug combinations. So with promising activity, move on to, to phase two or three. So it gives us, a, as a surrogate endpoint, the major pathologic response. You get pre and post treatment biospecimens. Uh, it's, if you have promising outcomes, then the biomarkers will be looked at, and uh, future development of randomized phase three trials will follow after that. Um, there is some precedent to this. So later stage disease uh, shows that when you add chemotherapy plus an IO, that there was an improve, I know you can't see this, there was an improvement in pathologic response between those patients who got chemo alone versus chemo plus IO, and it was a significant improvement in overall response. Partial response was 55% as opposed to 20 something percent with chemo alone in advanced stage disease. So at least some of this data justifies moving this kind of therapy into earlier stage disease. Finally, uh, the last study I wanna talk about, any questions about the lung platform? Okay, finally, the uh, last proposed study schema. This is coming out of Memphis by Ray O, very uh, ambitious and energetic medical oncologist who invented a, a lymph node uh, resection tray. Basically, it's a plastic tray that at the time of surgery, the um, back table where the, where the scrub tech is, there's a lymph node tray that says, here's your level fours, your twos, your sevens, your nines, et cetera. And they found that in the preliminary studies that they went from having an inadequate lymphadenectomy in upwards of 33 to 50% of cases that with this lymph node kit, that the lymphadenectomy improved to upwards of 90% or higher compliance. They also found that when you took the kit away, that although there's somewhat of a Hawthorne effect that people are watching you, you're gonna do a better job, when they took the kit away, that the surgeons reverted back to their old ways of doing an inadequate lymphadenectomy, which was surprising to me when I read their papers. The other interesting aspect of this is that they found that when they had an improved lymphadenectomy, that overall survival improved by upwards of 20% or more. So the, the proposed schema of a trial was that patients who have resectable um, disease would be randomized either to a conventional lymph node dissection where you have no kit, the other group would be using a kit. Um, it looks like right now about uh, 1,200 patients uh, will be necessary for this 
um, study based on the statistics, looking to enter uh, or enroll 40 different centers in this. It's going to be um, funded hopefully soon, and R01 is going in this week for it. So primary endpoints are comparison of disease-free survival, secondary overall survival, nodal upstaging rates, exploratory would be looking at blood and tissue. Eligibility is basically anybody that has a resectable early stage, meaning not 3A uh, lung cancer and age greater than 18. Okay, questions about silent. This is the lung cancer lymph node staging. Okay, I got nothing else. Questions for Wayne? Can I just ask you, Wayne, for the, the, the platform for the for 3A disease? So do you guys have anything that's been sort of approved or run through yet, or is it more conceptual and then you're gonna use that as the, whatever you wanna call it, platform infrastructure to do the first drug trial when you settle on what you're gonna do? Yeah, yes and yes. So it's um, the lung cancer platform is not just for 3A, it's for 1B to 3A. Um, we started out with a, one uh, idea and found out that as that got into, in fact, a week ago, we went to a, to a talk and found that that had already been completed and is already in a phase three trial. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for us to keep ahead. So right now, the idea is to look for a proper combination. When you run that combination, you can go to the next and then the next and the next. So at least part of it is a proof of concept that we can run short, small trials to show that our surrogate endpoint is major pathologic response rather than survival, and then push those over into, into you know, phase two and three studies. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a way for us to all get involved in a window of opportunity trial, so that patients that are coming to see us with you know, earlier, more locally advanced disease, have the opportunity to get onto trials, and then we can get ahead, because uh, I don't think we're gonna get ahead much with just operating. We gotta be doing something to try to get those extra you know, patients into studies. I know, it's, it's a cool idea. Chris? Yeah, I'm just wondering about uh, patient trials, because I think that there's a trial similarly designed for, for Nevo, and there's also a Pembro trial as well, so I, I wondered uh, how you're going to handle those, those bigger trials, which are already kind of and, getting and that's started. The, the one that you brought up is going to be coming up into a phase three 700 patient trial, so that's why we had a Pembro, IO, uh, Pembro chemo with a platinum-based chemo that was proposed, and then we found out about this you know, phase three study coming up and said, okay, we're going to restructure. So there's a lot of different things that we can look at. You know, you can look at IO plus targeted therapy, uh, different types of IO plus, you know, IDOs, et cetera. So there's many different combinations that we can be looking at. And that was, that was what the proposal, proposal was that would you, we would use this platform to move on from drug to drug to drug. So you're right. There's going to be a lot of competing trials. I think one of our major stumbling blocks and one of the, one of the, um, the opportunities for us is to figure out how to get ahead, how to get ahead of the market right now. Wayne, um, <clears throat> Wayne. Hello. Hi, Steve, how are you? Um, would you consider um, stage four with isolated METs? Uh, we, we've included that at our homegrown institutional induction therapy. So, you know, brain MET. Long. I mean, few patients, but I, I think it would be nice to capture them. Yeah, I, I don't know about this trial, um, but it, I, I will say, and I don't see any reason why you couldn't, because if the, if the endpoint is major pathologic response and not survival, I don't see any reason why you couldn't. Steve is going to come up a little bit later and talk about the NRG Oligomet trial. We ran the Oligomet trial through MD Anderson, which was stopped early for efficacy uh, by the, the safety monitoring board, but NRG is running an Oligomet trial, which... So we didn't want to compete necessarily with the Olgo Metro. It's a good question. I think the platform idea is a really cool one. Um, just as you know, the space is moving so quickly. Uh, you know, even, even at the co-op group level, there's constant reshifts all the time. Linda will talk a little bit more about this later today, but you know, just trying to keep your eye on the ball and just get a concept through without it becoming completely redundant by the time the ink's dry on the paper has been a problem. So the problem is, is that you know, people are running these trials so quickly on an individual basis in their own institution that to get through a cooperative group, which takes months to get these things approved, by the time you get it approved, it's already obsolete. So the companies that we're working with, they don't even know what's going on in their own company. So they, you know, we, we get approval from the company, or at least a verbal approval, to go ahead with that you know, combination. 
then by the time three months later that it's written up uh, and in for approval with SWOG, and they're like, oh, that's already done. So, you know, I think that is a challenge for us. And just a quick question about the MISO study. I think that one's really interesting also. W were there any dilemmas or controversy around like type of surgery? That, that seemed to be the, the thing that everyone got hung up on when um, concepts like this have come up through the alliance in terms of how do, you, how do you standardize everything well enough in terms of how people are treating the patients to be able to actually run a window study on top of that. So because this is a phase one, two study and you're just looking for safety, and toxicity, um, the, you know, the requirement was going to be that we wanted groups who are doing a high volume and it could do a PD or an EPP to open the trial. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you have to worry about when you say it's a PD, it's really a PD and not just that you've gone in and stripped a little bit of the pleura and called it an operation. So uh, there is not a requirement right now to send in video of your operation, uh, but I think there will be consideration when, when you know, individual institutions apply to say, okay, this, is, this looks like a group that has high enough volume and does a good job with MISO. But again, it's just a phase one, two trial, so they're looking for safety and feasibility. So I'm also really interested in the mesothelioma trial. I think it's great we're finally doing something in the neoadjuvant setting for that. Um, but I, I listen to all these discussions in the Respiratory Committee at Alliance, and there's all these trials going on in stage four, unresectable meso. Uh, and that the sarcomatoid variants actually have really high PD-1 expression or PDL one expression. And I just wonder, could we maybe make sarcomatoid meso a surgical disease again with these therapies? And I'm wondering if there's interest in, I know you're including biphasic, but maybe it's worth including some sarcomatoid patients and just see what kind of a response you get. Yeah, it, there was a lot of discussions back and forth with that, and Anne ultimately decided that she wanted to include just the ones and twos because the secondary endpoint was going to be survival. So I agree. I, I think that, you know, once this trial goes through, if we see a signal from this trial, then it would open up and you would open it up to sarcomatoid. So I, I agree completely.